Folks, hello, I am Dr. Mike Israel for Renaissance Periodization. This is Dr. Derek Wilcox of also Renaissance Periodization. And Derek is a uh, former equipped powerlifting champion record holder, the whole deal. And we actually have two things to talk to you guys about today. One is water cutting for sports of all kinds. Well, weight class sports where you have to make a water cut. And we're going to be specifically focused on probably what longer duration water cuts, like when you're 24 hours out, 12 hours out, 12 hours out sort of thing. Or do you want to chat any of them? Any two hour and then sure. that side as well. That side, they're all Excellent. similar dynamics. Excellent. And in the back of your minds, I want you to also think of the Steven Seagal movies Under Siege 1, which was on a, a boat, and Under Siege 2, which was on a train. Under Siege 3 on a plane, and my personal favorite hypothetical movie, Under Siege 4, the dirigible slash Zeppelin slash blimp version, is highly awaited, but uh, not around. One day, if we're lucky. Dear Mr. Seagal, <laughs> Esquire, please get on to making those movies. In the interim, real quick, before we talk about the at least seven common mistakes of water cutting, Derek, what was your most uh, extreme water cut that still resulted in a high degree of performance and thus a good showing on the powerlifting platform for you? I would say around 25 pounds. You uh, started at what and weighed in at what? Uh, I started at 223 and got down to 198. Weighed in successfully. Mm -hmm. Reconstituted well. Reconstituted well. up to what? Back up to around 223, 225. Day of the meet. Oh, yeah. And performed... Performed well, at least up to standards. You know, not a crazy day, but it wasn't a bad day. Yeah. And that's most of the time when you introduce a big water cut, that's about the most you can hope for because, you know, there's so much stress and a little bit of fatigue that comes from that, that you're really just trying to bring your performance that's been in training at that higher body weight and present it in a lower weight class by bringing your body weight back up. So, um, uh, it's hard to have a really big, huge jump in performance when you're putting your body through that much stress. So what you're saying is any extreme water cut comes at the trade-off of hitting these magic meat PRs and that more than likely what you're doing is making a calculated trade-off of saying, I could have the meat of my life at 220 or I can have a much better meat at 198 than anyone else at 198 but not exactly hit these superstar 242 numbers at 198. Right. I, ideally, you're just trying to uh, maximize that specific weight class. And a lot of the times, I only recommend people have these big water cuts. One, if it's some kind of super high priority, like a professional meet for money, you're trying to actually win something significant, or you're trying to break a, a big record. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it's like local state records are always going to be there. There's plenty of those to have yes. national world, all time records. Those kinds of things are what really make those big weight cuts worth it. To yes. Me. In my mindset, every meet is a life or death weight cut because I'm a, a fucking champion <laughs> and I always bring 100%. What would you say to that as a powerlifting coach? More power to you. Okay. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're going to you're laughing a, at me. Why are you laughing? I'm, that's just coming straight from my heart, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a jovial fellow. No, it's, that's a really good recipe for very short longevity. Career longevity or longevity longevity? Yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent. <laughs> Here lies Dr. Mike. He died peaking for a powerlifting meet. Yes. P.S. He wasn't even that strong. I would like that on my tombstone. Is tombstone actually a thing or is that just a brand of pizza? that you heat up in the oven by yourself when you're lonely and at home. You, you can, yeah, double entendre there. You can have an epitaph on one of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess you could put that on a pizza. Why not? You know? Yeah. In pepperoni yes. shapes. Excellent. <laughs> now that we got all the important stuff out of the way to the particulars. So you sent me a little list, which is actually in an RP article that people can Google. Mm -hmm. And um, it is uh, some common mistakes in water cutting. And I want your, your hot takes on all these. Sure. First is loading water too much slash too little. What the fuck is water <laughs> loading? How's that different from when I get, uh, as the French say, a thirst and I simply drink, drink, drink. Sure. Uh, the biggest part of water 
manipulation is tricking your body into holding less water than it normally does simply to bring the number on the scale down. Um, what we do with water loading is we're going to intake, you know, way more, usually at least double the amount of normal recommended water so that we can start manipulating hormones inside the body like ADH and aldosterone, et cetera, et cetera, angiotensin II, all these like blood pressure and kidney regulating hormones that change how much fluid are held in your bloodstream mm -hmm. as well as your cells. Mm -hmm. And when we have consistently high amounts or a hyper hydration, hydrated state, your body is going to naturally start changing those hormones and pushing all the fluid out that it can. Kind of like relaxing its need for water. Right. It's, it's opening the floodgates in your kidneys mm -hmm. and you start peeing like crazy. So these hormones don't take all that long to get manipulated. We're talking about the course of, you know, hours not days, not Whoa. weeks. So I started water loading six years before my first meet. <laughs> overkill. <laughs> you probably went through a few toilets for that. Gloriously bloated. Yeah. <laughs> Just the velocity of the urine hitting the porcelain over and over <laughs> again right. for that much frequency. The, the guy who fixed the toilet, he's like, is there a horse that lives here <laughs> also? But yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I see the most because, you know, it's a short time period to really get those hormones going to a significant degree. But I've talked to so many people that start water loading two weeks. I've even heard up to a month before a competition, which, you know, a month in the course of you know, looking at a window of hours, it's not overly practical. It's just going to add a ton of stress to your meat prep and probably, you know, shoot yourself in the foot with your training performance, getting ready for it. Also, if you pee on your foot, you can shoot yourself in the dick because the <laughs> urine speed. There's, there's so much inner bladder uh, pressure to just go <laughs> shoot out a crazy velocity. The doctor's like, you. well, you're going to lose your toe. Also, believe it or not, your insides are fucked because that much pressure on the insides is also bad for you. Yeah, exactly. Fuck. All right. So in your worldview, water loading should look like what and start approximately when if I'm, let's say, I have a... 24 hour weigh in. 24 hour weigh in. Uh, the process would usually start five, maybe six days out. Uh, we we'll start drinking, you know, somewhere around double the recommended amount. The recommended amount is about was it one ounce per kilogram okay. of weight. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Sometimes we'll take that up to like three, three ounces okay. per kilogram of weight. Okay. Um, for me, that always ended up being somewhere between two, two and a half gallons. That's exactly what my mental math looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's not crazy. No, that's it's like not. four gallons or some shit. Right. Well, we're, we're manipulating all these things and you can definitely drink a lot more. It doesn't take a crazy, crazy amount. I've seen people drinking like four gallons a day and I'm like, I hope that was fun because there was no added benefit to it in the least. Uh, there was a lady who drank eight gallons for a radio contest to win some kind of prize. Like it was um, like a PlayStation or something, I think. Yeah, yeah. She drank like eight gallons and died. Yeah. So hyponatremia is a real thing. Yeah, yeah. Your body just doesn't know how to function anymore. There's no signaling neurologically going on anymore. But that that's part of the process. We'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, usually about five or six days with two to three days of that really, really high water intake. Uh, we accompany it with salt as mm -hmm. well, because you have to pay attention to those electrolytes mm -hmm. and all the other hormones that are based around fluid retention that are based on that specifically, like aldosterone for the most mm -hmm. part. And then we start changing those things and we go to a distilled water so that there's very little in the water to begin with that can attach to anything else. High water, high electrolytes first. Yes. Continue high water, remove electrolytes. Exactly. It helps push all those remaining electrolytes out very quickly. Let me guess, next you start to remove water. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> it's the craziest thing because you have such a quick velocity of pushing all that body fluid out because of all the hormone changes and if nothing else, the pressure of more water coming in. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't taper it down slowly, you cut it off all at once, then you get a really great effect of your body pushing out the water before it knows that it doesn't have any more coming in. Yes. So you're a fan of when the water is pulled, it's pulled either very low or to nothing at all. Yes. Basically, when the water is cut off, you don't drink again until after weigh-ins. And how long do you want that period of no water coming in? Depends on how much there is to cut. Again, we're talking about 24-hour weigh-ins, but you know, two-hour weigh-in, all those different time factors really play a big, sure. big part of it. And that. that's going to be something we can access in 
future articles and books, et cetera, by you. Certainly. Yeah. Okay. But generally speaking, a good range for most applications is what, like 24 hours to 12 hours, or we're talking about 48 hours with no water. For just, just for an example, like that 25 pound cut that was very successful. Very me, extreme. Yeah. Uh, mine, my time without water was about 36 hours. Okay. Oh, wow. That's not that so, long. Yeah. So that's the longest that I ever took it. But that's also to give more time between that point of getting that flushing effect by the body to drop all that water weight to having enough time to sweat the rest of it out. Yes. No. And there's okay. so many different methods for that. Okay. So myth number one, loading water too much too early. So I start loading water any more than a few days before. It's stupid. If I start loading water the day before, you're just going to get really bloated and then <laughs> backwards to what we want. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. We actually knocked out two because okay. the second one is water loading too early. Number three, tapering water intake down. What do you see people? Oh, so the myth is tapering water down. Right. You need to high water, high water, trick the body into thinking there's too much water. I, all of my hormonal changes basically make me a water dropping machine. Yep. And then you stop the water such that the body is still pissing out like crazy, but there's nothing coming in. So you get this magic period of several hours of extreme diuresis. And that allows you to push that momentum all the way to becoming very light and low in water. Right. So this method is something I've seen with people that would start water loading like two weeks out. And I think it comes from kind of the, like maybe magazine articles of bodybuilding a long time ago. And there are certain parts of the protocol for bodybuilding peaking with water manipulation that, you know, like medications and such that are tossed in that also manipulate the fluid. Yes. Um, yeah. And they kind of leave that part out or they didn't know about it. Yes. So that water tapering was often accompanied by different diuretics and things like that. And, and let's not cut those people too much slack either. Sure. I've known plenty of bodybuilders who would cut their salt six weeks out. Yeah. Which not, is like, not good. It's just like nonsense your coach tells you and you carry around a jug and you think you're cool because you carry on the jug. Take enough drugs and diet long enough so that you're lean and everyone thinks you're correct just because you look like that. Right. And then you just never examine those ideas again. Yeah. The, the goal for bodybuilding is to look good on stage at that exact moment. Like, does the rest of the time really matter that much? I guess unless you're on Instagram. Actually, it just time. matters not at all. Right. Yeah. So it's the same thing for weighing in. You don't want to be that weight aside from that instant that you step on the scale yes. and then you want to be on your way back yes. up. Okay. So, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Number three is tapering water and take down. We got that. So don't do that. Cut hard. Right. And then number four is it, now, okay, real quick. I know some people are going to ask this. You fucking people. <laughs> I'm still eating food. Hmm? Is it okay if the food has a little bit of water in it? Like I'm not talking about cereal with milk, but like I want to eat some white rice and white rice is made with water. Is that okay? Or am I going to rice cakes only? Rice cakes definitely have benefits there. Uh, a lot of times I'll work with people, especially with the shorter weigh-in periods, uh, we'll go ahead and get as dehydrated as possible to get below the weight class and then start adding in carbohydrates as dry as possible, just like those rice cakes that you're talking oh. about, to where you're basically exchanging water weight and carbohydrate weight or muscle glycogen weight. You drop the water weight and the muscle, the glycogen will also drop from low-carb diet yes. through the week. But once you get your body weight to a certain lower point below your weight class, you can start adding in carbohydrates in exchange for less water weight, but you have more potential energy stored in the muscle. Yes. And when you add the water back in, it, it sticks. soaks it up. It sticks oh, so well. Oh, that's brilliant. Yep. But that, that period of higher carbs, lower water for a few hours is brutal because your thirst response is going right. to go into the Right. Because okay. yep, your body's pulling so much more fluid that's, that whatever's left basically into the muscles. Yes. But especially doing that the night before weigh-ins helps sleep quality immensely. Oh, because you get some carbs, you're fucking out. Yep. That's fucking brilliant. Um, ignoring electrolyte balance is number four. I ignore electrolyte balance because that word electrolyte is too big for me to be able to spell. I don't understand it. It offends me. And thus I ignore it and I just pretend it's too sciencey and lame. I would use another word we used to use in the 90s, also meant lame, but it's now a cancelable offense. In any case, <laughs> what am I going to do with electrolyte balance here during a water cutting process that's going to really help me out? 
Uh, paying attention to your salt intake is the most influential part of that. Okay. Uh, like I mentioned before, with the water loading, we're trying to increase that state of hyperhydration. Yes. And basically doing everything we can to get the body to hold as much water as possible. We're trying to bloat on purpose. Yeah, exactly. And that always freaks people out because the scale is going to go up a little bit. Oh, yeah. There's a typical freak out of, you know, the next day you're two pounds heavier than you were before. You're supposed to be going down like, ah, what's going on? Right. So I have to tell everyone, basically expect this. You're going to look like a swollen tick on a dog's back the next day. But... The day after that, typically you're back down to where you started or a little bit lower and you're that all the fluid retention in your skin and everywhere else is starting to come out. Because and you're hormones, peeing like crazy. Exactly. The, the hormones are doing what they're supposed to. And you look like a normal tick. Yes. Like a tick that if you look back into a tick yearbook, you'd be like, that's a good looking tick. Yeah. Back in the day before it got so big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then during the carb reintroduction process towards the end, mm -hmm. you don't reintroduce electrolytes just yet. Depends on how much play room we have with the body weight. Okay. Uh, if you can add in a little bit of salt, just to mainly prevent cramping. Right. Because salt by itself knows. doesn't blow you up. Right. It attracts water. That it holds move. like 40 times its own weight in right. fluid. So right. that's that's why it's so influential. And I right. think carbohydrates are around four times. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So that actually perfectly brings us into number five mistake. Poor reconstitution or recomposition. Um, what is it that people get most wrong about recomping where do they go wrong with that they don't think about what they need to eat or drink to hold on to the water let me tell you my plan for recomping after 24 hour weigh-in men especially strong people of any gender or sex are made with steak fatty steak <laughs> i go in and it's got salt yeah so i check one uh salt and i have some uh, some uh sweet tea uh a nice steak tons of eggs I'm good. <laughs> Correct? Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the big thing with that is it, it's a very, very common issue. After weighing in, especially for 24 hour weigh ins, because you're food. thinking you're just going to gorge yourself or whatever. It. Cupcakes, it, steak. Yeah, there's no strategy. It's just, okay, I got to put on weight. How do you put on weight? You eat a bunch of crap. And I watch an episode of my 600 pound life TV show and I go, whatever the fuck those people are eating. That clearly puts on weight, and then I just order a pizza. They're permanently reconstituting there. A pizza. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the doctor's like, on the bad side of things, you're dying. Yeah. On the good side, you're very full of all sorts of life. Maybe too much. Yeah. Life okay. potential, I guess. So before I eat a pizza that is wrapped around a Taco Bell <laughs> order, that's right, <laughs> a pizzerito. <laughs> and because the pizza is the wrapping, it also culturally becomes a burrito or taco. Right. And then it sort of... Makes a lot of sense. But clearly I'm going wrong there. <laughs> what should most folks be eating in order to get back as much of their water weight as possible? So the big thing is you want to keep digestion moving quickly. A lot of people get shut down like crazy right. when they eat tons of fats and stuff. Yeah. So fat is going to slow down digestion, green vegetables, high fiber. That's going to slow down digestion. So you really just focus on a moderate amount of protein, primarily just carbohydrates. Yeah. And you drink naturally because you're trying to get all that food in anyway. And you want to stay away from, you know, anything fatty in general. Because it's going to start changing with those uh, signaling mechanisms in the stomach. It's going to tell your brain, I'm not hungry anymore. Yeah. And you better be hungry if you're putting on 20 pounds of weight in one day. You are ruining the powerlifting recomp of donuts and pizza and yeah. burritos. What I want to do, Derek, is pretty simple. I want to compete in powerlifting. And I want to weigh in under my weight and take some selfies and of the scale <laughs> And then I want kind of an Instagram story timeline of all the fun foods I eat with my cool powerlifting friends. I know I have a meet, whatever, in 24 hours, which I have to optimize my performance. But that's, but I can always have not so great meat, but my outfits look cute. And I can post that I had fun with my boyfriend anyway when I went to Las Vegas to compete. Absolutely. And my followers don't seem to care about my meat results. They care about how I look when I compete and also that I'm having fun and being cute. And having fun means I eat junk food. You're ruining all this for me, but assuming I'm the weird kind of person that wants performance and actually wins stuff, um, I'm sticking to what kinds of foods. Can you give me some sample foods? Because I'm just not that creative. Everything I thought of, pizza, beer, pizza, <laughs> leftover pizza crusts. Yeah, yeah. I got nothing. What kind of foods? Because clearly all the normal junk foods are off the table. Right. Because I ate them. <laughs> 
Uh, the typical thing you go to after weighing in for powerlifting meet is either IHOP or Waffle House. That's and a rule in powerlifting. It, you basically always, or Bob Evans. That's a Bob big Evans too. if you're in the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, most of the time they're cooking on this giant griddle and they just like throw four pounds of butter on there at yes. once and then cook everything. On so top when you're like, it. can I have no butter? They're like, uh, -huh. but yeah, they don't sure. mean that. They're not going to add another pound of butter on top of <laughs> yes. your order before yes. they cook it. Yes. Uh, so that, that really causes you to run into problems. Uh, if you can stick with, you know, a light potato, okay. like a hash brown that's really light in oil or okay. something like that. Baked potato? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay. The fiber starts to run into a little bit of issue there, okay. but okay. not Fine. not major. Okay. Um, cereal can work okay if it's a yes. low fiber cereal. Okay, so go to the store and get kids cereal is a better option than go to the griddle house and get griddle house stuff. Right, because most right. of the time you're not going to have four pounds of butter in your cereal. Most of the time, yes. <laughs> most of the time. Uh, things like that. But it's basically the reverse of what you were doing before because you started with high salt and then you drop your carbs. Now you're going to reintroduce all the salt that you want, just like you're salt loading again because you've depleted your body. Yes. You need to reintroduce it. Yes. But since those hormones have flipped, the aldosterone has changed its uh, direction to where it's going to cause you to retain more salt. Yes. Your body is going to be really prepared to hold on to it. Now, yes, which is good. Which is exactly what you want because water retention is going to come much faster. If you've had a low carb diet through the week, your insulin sensitivity is going to be up through the roof. And when you add those carbohydrates in after you've weighed in, your body is going to just soak it all up, shoot it straight into the muscle, and you'll be ready to perform. Great. Kids' cereals, I surmise sushi, if it's all you can eat sushi, if it's mostly not the bullshit American stuff, but like actual, just like sushi rolls, yep. nigiri. Uh, which is great because with the um, soy sauce, mm -hmm. it's salt and sushi and Perfect. water. It's all the great stuff. Yeah, don't don't go getting the low sodium soy sauce on those days. Get the big stuff. The real <laughs> man shit. Uh, kids cereal is good. Something like a Subway sandwich with like turkey and uh, just the bread and not a whole lot of cheeses and stuff is okay. Sure. Uh, a lot of that, especially on meat day as well, uh, it's finding those foods that are low in fiber, low in fat, and your stomach can easily digest. You right. don't want to go eating stuff that you're not accustomed to and okay. at all okay. during those times because your stomach is going to be more easy to upset at that point. And you've yes. got to keep going. Like yes. you, you also want to keep moving through the day as you're reconstituting to keep your circulation going. And it helps digestion moving quicker as well. Moving how? Just walking around. So having a good time and just looking at stuff. Sure. Uh, trying to stay out of heat is a big one. I've made that mistake before. Just don't go to Disney World before your powerlifting. Meet. Yeah, exactly. I, I had a meet in Nashville one time, and I was trying to reconstitute and was walking around Broadway Street Bye. and going in the bars, and I'm like, I have a bag full of chips, and I'm eating and a gallon of water that I'm carrying around, but it was hot, right. and it was working gallon against in, gallon me. Gallon out. Right. Okay. So lesson learned there. Okay. Um is there a gram of carbohydrates amount, roughly, you want, like, the average sort of 200-pound powerlifter to consume in a 24-hour weigh-in? Are we looking at 500 grams that day? Are we looking at 1,000? Are we looking at 1,500? Are we looking at 2,000? There's not really a limit. It's The limit is going to come from your stomach. Okay. So almost sure. nobody gets too bloated right. in a recomp. It's yeah. mostly just not bloated enough. Yeah. You're, you're going to hopefully reach those mi maximum muscle glycogen stores, but it's really hard to do it one day. Yes. Yes. Unless you're using exogenous resources there. That can help a lot. But uh, if you're, especially if it's a drug tested meat or something like that, your stomach is going to hit that limit before right. you go to too many carbohydrates. Another great food. Let me know if this is wrong. Frozen yogurt. Because it's super low in fat, sometimes fat free, mm -hmm. tons of carbs. Yeah. And you can eat it. What I like to do personally is alternate salty and sweet foods because after you eat a salty food, even though more salty food is meh, yeah. like let's say you have a bunch of like low fat Asian noodles with a bit of chicken. Yep. I can eat like 250 grams of carbs of those and not even fucking bat an eye. But then someone's like more salty stuff and you're like, mm -mm. but they're like frozen yogurt. You're like, yes, because your dessert, female dessert stomach opens up. Nope. We all have one, no matter the <laughs> sex or gender. Uh, and then you eat a bunch of frozen yogurt and then you eat the sweet stuff. You're good to go. But then your next meal, you're super crazy for the salty stuff again. Mm -hmm. So then you go out for sushi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Decent. Sure. All those are fine choices. Yeah, definitely. If that, Especially if you already know that your stomach can handle it really yes. well. So no new shit. Right. Okay. Uh, my, my big thing was always uh, eating like restaurant-style, uh, Tostito-style nachos with a little bit of salsa. 
I would add salt to the salsa, and those those things were already just completely covered in salt, oh, and just that's the chips that I was eating walking around, and they, I would end up looking like a chipmunk with nuts in my mouth just all day, like eat two family sized bags of those. Oh my god! But it put the weight on really quickly. So. Sure, good God! All right, number six mistake is diuretics. How's that a mistake? <laughs> that's what makes me get the water off. Dr. Wilcox for the, the people that I've seen that have used those a lot. One, there's so much trial and error to begin with. Sure. Trying to figure out when you should take what and at, you know, which kind of diuretic to take, how your body specifically reacts to those. Yes. There's so many variables there that would take so many different trials to figure out. Yes. And I, tons of the professionals that I was around that really got that system refined, they had it down. And it worked really well, but there were probably, you know, three, four, five, six meets that they really undershot their, right. their performance okay. by having to experiment instead of going with a tried and true method. Okay. So it's it's a big role of the dice, and that's also where you can start getting to a lot bigger health risks. Oh, too. yeah. So uh, those kidneys do not care for those diuretics, especially when you're already trying to dehydrate yourself and under that much stress. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a bad deal. Um, luckily, there are no huge amount of dead power lifters but you don't right. want to be the first in that category yeah very true very true you'll always be in first place but <laughs> also unable to collect your trophy that's a detriment yes okay number seven last one is depleting diets before the water cut what does that mean so i've had several people come to me in this kind of situation where they are way above their weight class and they they realize this like a month out Okay, I need to drop 10 kilos to get to my weight class. I, I can feel how this is happening. They're in the gym. They hit a good PR. Someone's like, hey, bud. It's in the south, of course. <laughs> hey, bud, you got a meet coming up? I'm like, sure do. Like, when's that meet? Like, four weeks out, brother. Like, oh, I'll tell you what, that's off. Now, what weight class are you competing at? And they're like, uh, oh, shit, 198. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, shit, I weighed 235. <laughs> Yeah, just didn't think about that until now. Uh, to be fair, I've seen that happen all over the country. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> but, uh, how, how do they sound in other parts? Hey, fuck you. Hey, what's up, Philadelphia guy? Whatever. <laughs> and like, hey, you got a me coming up, you fat fuck? And you're like, yeah, I'm at 181, but I'm fat. Oh, shit, that's bad. Whoa. Yeah, I'm not even going to try the accents. Yeah, I can't right. do them that well. Uh, but what happens is, like, the week of protocol that we we're talking about, carbohydrates are a lot lower. Uh, we're manipulating all kinds of things to create a lot of water retention. And when you're training normally, you need to be eating to sustain your performance, yes. which does mean eating carbohydrates. You don't yes. want to change those things leading up to a competition that yes. much. So what these people end up doing is they'll go on a crash diet like two, three, four weeks out to try and get down to the weight class. No carbs, no fats, chicken and veggies. Yeah, basically some green veggies and proteins. And Which you can only drink so much water with that until you become a diuretic machine simply because there's no carbs and mostly no salt holding it in. So you end right. up starting that diuretic hormone enhancement way too early. Right. It's the same effect with a, a keto diet. You're going to get that immediate drop yes, after about a week. But that drop now is drop you can't do later. Right. That's oh. exactly the problem. So they're depleting. They're getting closer, but they're getting closer like two, three weeks out and you're they don't know it, but you can't just add a depletion strategy on top of another depletion yes, strategy. Yes, because, because they'll be like, not root. well, my last meet, I lost 15 pounds. You're like, I gotcha. But this time you're going to lose 15 pounds again and you already lost seven. Yeah. So it's not 15 from now. It's 15 from when you started three weeks ago, plus yeah. maybe three or four pounds of tissue that you lost. Yeah. And when you do this process correctly through water manipulation, you're going to lose that weight about... 36 hours beforehand, yeah, it starts coming down significantly yeah. at yeah. that point. And you're going to gain it in about 12, 12 hours after you weigh in. Yes. That's how quick that needs to be. Yes, not weeks. Not weeks, because you're just putting your body through a ton of unneeded stress. Yeah. So ideally, watch your weight, know what weight class you're at, and get within whatever percentage you know is reasonable before your peaking phase starts. Right. Arguably before your strength phase starts, such yeah. that if you are a 220 pound power lifter and you normally can cut from 235 no problem you'd be around 235 by the time you start getting into sets of three and six three to six reps like strength yeah. phase so you just can train at that body weight so because this happens 
all the time. Guys awesome. who are 220, they'd be like, oh, I'm at 250 right now. And you're like, okay, well, how many weeks do you have to meet? And they're like, well, like eight weeks, but I can make the cut. And you're like, okay, so you're going to make the cut during peaking, which is the most important time for you to be hitting PRs. Right. And the very reason they get up to 250 is some combination of sloth, but also they're hitting mega PRs because they're mm -hmm. so goddamn big. But like, no, no, you're too big, too big. And that's going to take a diet. And the best time for a diet is during a hypertrophy phase, which is way before your powerlifting meet, way even before the strength phase. Exactly. I, I try to tell my clients and the people who sign up just for the, the water manipulation coaching for the week of their competition, uh, you want to be set with your body weight leading up to it, ideally eight weeks out, at the very, very least four weeks out. Yes. Because usually before that, you're in your higher volume stages and your training. If you're going to be making body composition and body weight changes, that's the best time to do it because you're going to help uh, keep from losing as much muscle mass during a calorie deficit, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. When training gets to be much lower volume, higher intensity, you know, we're a little bit more susceptible to that. And you also need the energy of a eucaloric diet when you're hitting fucking big ass PRs the month before the meet because right. peaking is not just something that this, like bodybuilding training is something that just happens. You just do it and it's fine. Um, Peaking training, you have to hit the big numbers. Right. Otherwise, like, what does your meat plan even look like? Like, yeah, I'm going to squat 800 at this meat. Like, how, how did 700 for three feel? Like, well, I missed all three reps. <laughs> but I was depleted. Like, so you haven't had any more than 700 on your back for a month because you're tired from your diet. Like, right. Well, yeah. Do you still get a squat 800? Like, yeah, it'll all come together. Like, yeah, where it'll all come apart literally as you tear your fucking quads off the bone. Because yeah. you're, you're going to accumulate so much literal damage to bone and tissue while you're, you know, calorie deficit at that point yes. with those higher intensity weights it's yes. just a recipe yes. for disaster on but day. weights that still aren't big enough to get you ready for the weights you're going to be needing doing exactly. that meat. yeah because your your brain and your nervous system really runs off carbohydrates to a large degree sure. and you also need sodium from salt to keep those um, ions flowing and for all the we have a lot of keto followers derek so if you can <laughs> rephrase your your brain likes the carbs to it doesn't matter and buy my keto bar low carb formula now if you don't mind it don't matter and that's really yeah. all you need to know derek i'm an aspiring young power lifter i want to be smart and i'm sitting it was a very sad story one of my many <laughs> uncles has passed sad but bequeathed me with an enormous fortune and i want to do this pile of me right and i want to hire dr Derek wilcox to do my training programming my diet programming, and especially, or just, my water cut. How do I get in contact with you? Well, you can message me on Instagram at Wilcox okay. Strength Inc. Or look me up on Facebook. Same deal there, Wilcox okay. Strength. Okay. Uh, and definitely go to rpstrength.com and go Easy. look at the coaching. Look up my profile. Your look face is one of the faces. Yes, my face is on the, the page. If you are not good with faces, his name is also listed under his profile. Yes. If yeah. you're good with neither names nor faces, have the person who cares for you contact <laughs> Derek. Thank you so much. This was really illustrative as people much smarter than me who have those big A plus words like to say. Syllables are good. Yep. And lastly, I noticed a little, uh, little accent there, Mr. Dr. Wilcox. Where, tell, why don't you tell the fine folks where you're from? I, I was born and raised in North Carolina. Carolina. The eastern shoreline, rich people, money having Washington, D.C. commuting part? No, sir. My folks is from deep in the hills. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of shit we like to hear. Derek, thank you so much for coming on the channel. Channel. I was going to say show. Perfect. I was going to say podcast. It's neither one of those things. I'm on the thing with you. And, you know, there's so much more that could be said. On that, that will get us both canceled. Folks, don't get canceled yourself. Don't cancel yourself with a water cut. Uh, be smart. Do the right things. And we'll see you next time.